Jeez. Whoops. I just squirted the camera. That was probably not good. By viewer request, Lingonberry Mead from Ikea. So somebody sent us two bottles of this stuff. And only today I noticed it said concentrate. <laughs> All this time I was going, okay, this is awesome, but we have a quart of this stuff. I have to get more. We went to Ikea and they don't have it. But they have this, which, which is, is their preserves. preserves. So we thought, hey, we can mix that with the preserves. But then today I found out that this is a concentrate. That changes the whole thing. We might not need any more. So the first thing I want to do is get a reading on this so that we know where it is. So I'm going to very carefully, we have a funnel right here. We have a funnel. I'm just going to use, I'm going to very carefully use the funnel to fill that because I just, I'll spill it. I just know. We need to know how concentrated their concentrate is, is the gist. It's pretty concentrated. Whoa! Yeah, that's off the charts concentrated. <laughs> is it concentrated or is it just heavy? Skin? I mean, literally, it's it's like viscous. It's like yeah. oil. This is a pneumatic piston now, okay? <laughs> that is amazing. So what, we can't even read that. It's not, it's No, but what rack. I can do, off the I have an idea. I already know what we're gonna do next. Okay, so here's how we're gonna handle this because we can't get a reading on this and we don't script this. I had never opened this before, so I had no idea what to expect. I'm gonna pour this into the fermenter and probably rinse it out with a little bit of water because there's lots of concentrate in there. And I don't wanna waste it. And I mean, this is good stuff. Get a little mix mix. <laughs> oh, the comment section's gonna love that one. And I'm just gonna dump that in there. And I'm going to dump in half of this because I don't really know I mean, this is, it's, it's very concentrated. So I don't know how concentrated. Let's find out. Here, I was thinking, we're just gonna dump both of those in, pour in a lot of jelly and, oh yeah, I'm glad we didn't do that. This is why it's always good to read the labels. So now that I have some water in here, I just wanna mix this up. And now I'm gonna take a reading of it so I can get an idea. This is gonna be a little bit of a trial and error kind of thing, or I could just do a lot of math. I'd rather just do the trial and error this time. And, you know, we're gonna take a reading, just like we always do. Graduated cylinder and hydrometer. Mm. Whoops. I just squirted the camera. That was probably not good. Okay, so half a bottle with about half a gallon of water is like a 1.040, yeah, 1.040 gravity. So what that means is, if I was to put in the rest of this and put in the rest of this water, I would have still a 1.040 gravity. That's good information. Now I can continue with that. So let's do that. There's a method to the madness. It'll make sense in a few minutes, trust me. But we also need to remember that we're trying to make a mead here. So yep. that means we need to add honey as well. Don't worry, I got you covered. In goes the concentrate. I wanna get all the juiciness out. One bottle, done. I'm not throwing that. <laughs> I am gonna pour in the rest of this water. So now we have a one gallon batch. Let me explain even more. I also made a tea. Now this is black tea with... Heather tips. Five grams to be exact because, oh my God, it was like this huge handful. But why did we end up using Heather tips? I'm glad you've asked that question because we know one of our favorite, yes, I might have a, a business crush if that's a thing on this company, is Grimfrost. And if you're familiar with Grimfrost, not only do they make really cool Nordic Viking style merchandise, they did the special effect prop weapons and jewelry and a lot of stuff for Vikings, the television series. But they also now make their own line of mead. And Not a sponsor, by the way. Just want to get that out. Just, Not a sponsor. I just have a business crash, that's all. <laughs> um, so they have their own Lincolnberry mead. Tea going in. And so I'll explain in a minute. I wanted to check on them and say, okay, what did they talk about? Well, they said that theirs uh, was inspired by the ancient mead and it has carefully sourced Swedish 
ingredients. Now, we're not in Sweden, we can't source stuff from Sweden. Well, we could, but it would be more complicated for us. They're in Sweden, so it's okay. But they used pine shoots and a rich heather honey mixed in with the lingonberries. So Brian, if you watched our gin replicas, he's not really a fan of the pine needle flavor, so he didn't really want to add a pine flavor to it. We didn't have any heather honey, but we did have heather tips. So Brian's crazy brain said, hey, let's make a heather tea with the black tea, so that way we have enough of the tannic addition to create that lovely mouthfeel. And then we can use a wildflower honey to go along with that, and we'll have a lingonberry mead adjacent to the flavor inspired profile. Inspired. Inspired, right. It's not going to be the same. Not thing. exactly the same, but it's okay. We city steady and fight it. <laughs> That's a word now. So what I did is I just used plain old black tea. Um, if you really want to get fancy and use a different tea, you totally can. It'll just taste different. The tea is not really there for flavor, it's there for tannin. Somebody asked me, what, how do you describe tannin in a mouthfeel? It means like that puckering effect, almost a drying effect in your mouth. That's what it's there for. It adds a little bit of body, gives a, a little bit of backbone to the mead. So that's why I wanted to add some. Lingonberry is a great flavor all on its own. It's, it's unique, it's very difficult to describe too. It's kind of, Cranberry, raspberry meets a couple other dozen fruits together. Really, really interesting, kind of cool stuff. And that's why I think as a mead, it's gonna work really, really nice. But the tea adds that little bit of extra body. The heather tips was really more just as a, an homage to Grimfrost because... It also has a little bit of earthiness Yeah, it does have a little bit. Which I think is gonna work well with the very right. citrus notes. So there you go. Now, I have all that in there. I pour the tea in, I have the liquid in, I have the lingonberry juice in there. Now I wanna take another reading. I know there's a lot of readings in this particular one, but it's because we're doing a trial and error type method. And there's nothing wrong with doing it this way. I'm not weighing as much. So we just wanna make sure that this is what I think it is so that I know how much honey to add. Now, if my approximation is right, this should be something like a 1040 to a 1036, something like that, because the tea would have diluted it slightly. Uh, somewhere in that range, and it is actually 1.036. So yeah, exactly spot on where we want it to be. Not a problem. At this point, you gotta ask yourself a question. How much alcohol you want? <laughs> and that's a thing you really do need to know because I can make this 15%, 18%, 12%, 8%, whatever we want. So if I know to be a mead, it has to have at least half, I mean, according to those people, has to have at least half of the fermentables come from honey, which if this is 1.036, that means I need to have at least one pound of honey to this, because that would be 1.035, it's, it's close enough. If the mead police show up at our door and you never see another video, you know what happened. But that's all I need to add. But if I added two pounds, then I'd have a 1.105 or thereabouts, 1.106, and that multiplies out to something in the 13% range. Hmm. That sounds about right to me. I think that's what we're gonna do. Two pounds of honey, getting ready to go in. All right, so I forgot to hit record, but we put two pounds of honey in here, so we're gonna take it off the scale now. The honey we used is from Bevy's Bees. It is a wildflower Florida honey, and I'm gonna do my best to, my, and I'm gonna do my best to mix this through, though I'm not overly concerned about mixing it all through, except to get a good reading. That's the only real reason, because as we showed in our Dunk Mead video, that you could just pour it all in, and it works. I don't see any more honey. It came together pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, a couple more additions. But first, I do wanna get another reading. And this one is like our real OG reading, okay? This is our original gravity. And yeah, everything was just sanitized because it just dripped all over me. All right, my reading should be something around a 1.100 or so. So let's just see where we're at. Oh, we're a little bit lower than that, 1.082. Hmm, that's a little bit surprising. The only thing I can figure is because we have more than a gallon now, Rule of thumb is it's 35 points in a gallon of must. We actually started with 4,000 milliliters, which is more than a gallon to begin with. And then the a honey little adds a tea. little bit of volume. The tea adds a little bit of volume. Personally, I'm okay with this. This doesn't bother me because it's still gonna come out to somewhere in the 
11 or 12% range, it's all good, not a problem. So we have our base notes, which is the honey and the lingonberry. Then we have our additive notes, which is the heather tips. We have our tannins from the tea. So now we need some acid. Right, because there's a trifecta of flavors when it comes to making any kind of a brew or food or anything really. And that is uh, acidic, sweet, and savory in cooking, but it's tannins in brewing. And when those three things are in balance, Things are amazing. So I'm just gonna take some lemon zest here. It's just the peel, and that didn't come off really nice at all. Yeah, I think it was the wrong zester. Oh well. That's all right. I'm doing it this way now. <laughs> I'm committed. Probably should be committed, but you know, that's another show. The trick is you just want some of the outside peel. You don't want the inside white pith. Um, people say that it makes it bitter. Uh, other people say, don't worry about it. You know what? I'm just gonna avoid it. Can't make it bitter if it's not there, even if it doesn't make it bitter, see? Solves the problem completely. I was only gonna use like two little swaths. <laughs> it's not cooperating. But it's not cooperating at all. <laughs> this is like the worst lemon ever. Okay, I used like half a lemon worth Ish. of zest. <laughs> Good enough. I gotta wash my hands, I'll be right back. Okay, so that's our acidic component. So all that's left now is something to make this make alcohol, and that would be the yeast. For that, we're gonna be using Red Star Premier Classique. It does go to 15%, which is a little bit of overkill for this particular brew, but it's okay. It'll guarantee that this will go dry. Now, when it goes dry, that means it's done, it's finished, it's stable. At that point, we don't need to do anything else to it other than rack, bottle, and put it away. But we can if we want to. And that's the important thing. So we're giving ourselves some options. By the way, Red Star, if you're listening, I don't want to have to cut packets, but I will. It's just not. I don't like to have to cut the packets. You should be able to just tear them open. Make terrible packets. They're already terrible packets, but that's a different kind of terrible. And I'm gonna use the whole packet of yeast. Sorry, I tried to get all that out without laughing. It's just one of those things. I'm gonna use a whole packet. Um, can you use less? Of course you can. You don't have to use the whole thing. I'm gonna black the your packet, packet. Get all that yeast out. And now I need that spoon back. So one more thing that you wanna put in with your yeast is some nutrient. Because honey doesn't have everything that a growing yeast needs. <laughs> so I just did two grams of Fermato, which is my yeast nutrient of choice, and a little bit of water. I'm trying desperately to break it up and it's not working really well, but it'll get in there. It's okay, it, it breaks up eventually. So I'm just gonna dump that right in and splash, apparently. Hey, it wouldn't be a city steading brew show if I didn't make a mess. <laughs> and then I just wanna give that a little bit of a stir to get all the yeast into the brew. It's not necessary, but I also want to mix it up and try to, I don't wanna splash, but I wanna oxygenate a little bit because I didn't, though, as we've learned, oxygenation, again, like in the dump mead, it was important, but it wasn't the end all. So I think if you have things properly made, it's not as big of a deal. This video apparently needed a, a warning at the beginning saying danger, you're in the splash zone. zone. <laughs> I had to wipe off the camera yeah, a little while ago. <laughs> that's, that's usually not a good thing. No. Okay, that is mixed as much as I want it to be. And now I'm gonna put on the lid and the airlock. Then what are we gonna do? We're gonna let it sit. This'll start up probably in the next 24 to 72 hours. I'm gonna put a label on it. There is something we are going to do. Brian will reach to his left. Far to his left. Far left down. Down, down. Oh. Ta-da! She likes to be obtuse and not I, tell me yes. what I'm going for. There's about 20 different things to my left. I want him to be as surprised as you are. I was. <laughs> thing is, is a lipped cookie or baking sheet. Yep. And the reason for it is that we don't know what this is going to do. More than likely, the yeast are going to get super happy and make a big giant mess, which is okay. It's just a mess. We don't want to mess on our new table. So if you put it in a tray with a lip, then that tray is going to collect the mess rather than your kitchen By the way, plants. if that does actually happen and you start seeing the brew get up into the airlock, 
just take the airlock out, clean it out, replace the fluid with more star sand sanitizer or with like a vodka or a cheap whiskey or um, a scotch that you don't like, you know, like Scoresby. Or you can totally replace that with tubing going into a mason jar filled with star sand fluid or even just water at that point. We have a video. It's a blow off tube. We have a video on blow off tubes and I'll make sure to link it in the description for you so that way if you're interested in making your own blow off tube, you too can do that at home. But this is going to go into the fermentation station once we know that it's not going to explode all over the kitchen. And uh, we'll be back to show you how it's doing. Lingonberry made, first check. All right, it's been three weeks. You know what that's time for. It's time to check. We inspect. It smells good. There is no unsightly anything. There's no mold. There's nothing growing in there that shouldn't be growing. And there's nothing growing. Well, nothing I can see growing in there. Let's put it that way. Because the yeast are certainly growing, or were. 1.000, which means this went dry. Now, what does that mean? It means that most all of the sugars have been used up. I mean, technically 1.000 isn't fully, fully, fully dry because it can go a little bit lower than that. So don't get confused by that. But the idea is it used up all the more or less available sugars. We are going to put the sample back in, let this go for another week, and we'll be back then to test it again. All right, so nine more days have gone by. We took a first reading and we got 1.000. Let's remove the lid. No, this is not a repeating video. <laughs> and take our second reading. This is like the verification video, okay? Well, what do you know? 1.000, again. Normally when it goes that far, you're pretty sure it's done. I like to give it another week just to make sure because it could actually go below 1.000. So a couple of people have asked, if it's, a, if it's there, how come you didn't just rack it? Well, that's why. So what we want to do at this point is give this a taste because we may want to alter it for conditioning phase. Just happen to have a glass handy. Almost like I planned it, huh? <laughs> I will say this much, it's already really attractive looking. Yeah. It's not the color I thought it would be. I expected it to stay kind of pink. It went kind of like apple cider color. I don't know what any of that just meant. Very ethanol on the smell. Not getting a whole lot of other things. My assessment, it needs a little sweetness and it needs a little tannin. Yeah, it is a little thin, a little wa watery almost on the mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. um, I was getting floral from the aroma. I, I do get a little bit of floral in the flavor. All right, let me, let me check again, you know, for science. This is part of the process. You wanna adapt as you go. We're starting to um, adapt our adaptations of the way we do things to um, do more, to be able to make more corrections on the fly yeah. um, rather than be more regimented. Okay, I kind of get it, but you know what? I hate to say it, but I have this weird thing that I get. I call it green, but really what I'm smelling and tasting sometimes is grapefruit. I hate grapefruit, okay? As a fruit, I, I absolutely hate it. I know people out there love it, I don't. So to me, I associate this bitter, almost citrusy thing to okay, grapefruit, and that's the youngness, the greenness that people ask about. If you like grapefruit, you probably like very young green wines. I wasn't getting that on the aroma. I was getting I it totally that get on it. the back end of the flavor profile. The front end of the flavor profile for me was actually really pleasant, surprisingly it's, it so. It smells <laughs> kind of like flowery grapefruit to me. Flowery grapefruit. Yeah, totally. The taste is not unpleasant but there's not a lot of flavor there. Now, did we taste? We did not actually taste just the lingonberry can, concentrate. For science, can we do that like right now? Yes. So I'm just sitting here watching this, looking at the bottle, doing the Derica Ikea to English translation, and that's a drink. Yeah. That's a drink. It's not a drink. But it says concentrate. It's a concentrate. So <laughs> we're gonna do a very unscientific quick tasting. I have here a little bit of water. That's probably about three ounces of water. I'm just gonna pour in a little bit of this concentrate. How much? That much. I don't know, teaspoon maybe? Because we know that we added two pounds of honey and one of these bottles to this and got a 1.084 gravity. So it added like 15 to 20 points of gravity to this, which that's considerable considering it's one and a half gallons. So just a little bit. We just made a drink. 
It's, it did the layer thing, so it looks like one of those fancy cocktails. Yeah, I gotta mix it though. <laughs> can I do the swirl? I don't know, can you? It's not mixing. <laughs> Let me get something. When in doubt, use a chopstick. Not just for eating anymore. Okay, I did not put much in here at all, but it did flip, it did alter the, the color. Hmm. Altered the flavor significantly too. Mm. Just that little bit. It's actually mm. really nice. It's really nice. Very sweet. I can see that adding a good amount of this is gonna make this quite sweet. So what I'm probably going to do is we'll do this by gravity readings rather than by it's like actual. like a fancy Kool-Aid. It really does taste kind of like Kool-Aid. So what I'm going to do is we're gonna rack this to a pitcher first and then I'll show you what we're gonna do next. So we put our sample into our pitcher so that way we weren't going to disturb the lease that we're trying to get rid of that's in here. This has all been sanitized. All of our items have been sanitized. Our hands have been sanitized. And now this is gonna be our destination. So it is going to be down here on the stool, lower from our- Source. Source, thank you, words, things. So leave. something I didn't, sorry, leaving the cap on because there's stuff in the bottom. There's leaves in the bottom. Something I didn't go over earlier, and it's an important aspect. When you remove the lid for the first time or any time you remove the lid, you want to do a visual inspection. Do you see stuff growing in there that shouldn't be growing? Does it smell awful? Do you want to puke after putting your face in there and smelling it? If not, you're probably fine. Now, from your angle, you may or may not be seeing large, flat, white things that are kind of floating. Those are orange peel. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's not anything to be afraid of. We, we put that in there. Yeah, the orange peel will sometimes go up and down and the yeast will collect on it and it just, it looks kind of funky at the end. The trick once you get started is try not to move, especially if you cannot see the end. Yeah. Like right now she said, I'm sitting on an orange peel. Okay, I'm gonna sit on an orange peel. If it starts to block it, then I'll move. Otherwise I'm staying there because the idea is you wanna leave the leaves behind and get out as much brew as you can. This is the first rack. It's not 100% critical. It is still gonna clear out some more, but eh, you know, be as good as you can. It's already really pretty, so we don't wanna mess this up. And then we're gonna add more stuff to it, totally make it not clear anymore. <laughs> you may notice a distinct lack of clarity in the brew after the racking process. It's because we got most of the way through and we're putting it into a pitcher and then realized we have more than the pitcher can hold. So we had to stop, which of course causes Lee's to go everywhere, and re-siphon to the big mouth bubbler and then start up a siphon again with only like this much in the bottom. That makes a mess. Is it a problem? No, it just means it's gonna take a few more days to clear. It is however gonna make the tasting a little odd. I mean, it's not bad, it's just there's gonna be some sediment floating in the liquid. Not a huge deal and it shouldn't actually change the flavor. It's just gonna be maybe not such a pleasant thing to do. That's about it. Brian has tactile issues. That's what we're concerned about. Yeah. So what I need to do is get a spoon. Be right back. When you introduce a new utensil to the process, what do you do? You sanitize it. All right. We know that this is very dry. We know that this is very sweet. So what I wanna do, I also know that this whole bottle added maybe 20 points in total. So. I'll probably end up using a quarter to half the bottle to sweeten this. I'm gonna start off with just a little bit, not too, too much, just maybe a little more nut. We are gonna take a reading when we're done to show you what the gravity is, but the actual amount, I mean, that was just probably a couple of ounces. Mix it through. It's, it's a concentrate that mixes really readily. As long as you don't just try to do a swirl, you actually have to use a spoon. Yeah. Collect a sample. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm instantly regretting this decision. <laughs> it's all right. Really, 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 really dry. So we need more. Yeah, we need more. I already feel like I'm getting more of the lingonberry flavor though. Yeah. Not quite a fourth of the bottle yet. It's changing the color significantly too. Yeah. We have to work on the tannic aspect as well. I got an idea for that. Don't you worry. It's all about balance. So if you have more acidity and more sweetness, then you need more tannin or vice versa, that kind of thing. You need some balance. We're getting there. I think it's close. I think it needs a little bit more. Mm. Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
like probably to the label, which will be about a third. So that's like five ounces or so. Yeah. Just like that. That much. There is a possibility of re-fermentation here, okay? Because we are using Premier Classique yeast. We do have a 1.084 original gravity that went to 1.00. That's just under 12%. There's a possibility. So we may end up doing this again. Very precise method. And it's just easier than pulling a, a sample out the other way. Hmm. Significantly better. I still feel like it needs more though. I feel like this wants to be sweet rather than dry. And we're, we're just on the verge of s like semi-dry. Yeah, like it's I, not... would, I would give it just a skosh more. A skosh. A skosh. Is that a, an actual measurement? <laughs> that's a skosh. That's a skosh. So now we're at about half the bottle. So that's like eight ounces used. I'm gonna guess we might end up like a 1.008 to 1.010 sweetness. Now, because of the acidity of this, that might be throwing it off. We might actually be sweeter than that. Yeah. That's a possibility. We'll find out. I always love it when I make those proclamations and then later on in the video I go, pretend I said this instead. <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> never proclaim to be a scientist. Just a guy that wants to see people make wine at home. That's pretty much it. Now I think we're there. You know, owing to the slight greenness that it has going on from being young, mm. that level of sweetness comes through. Mm -hmm. The honey is there too. Like I think it actually comes through quite nicely. I, I'm I'm pretty reasonably thrilled with with that. What do you think? It feels like lime was added to it. It does. That's the lingonberry. It has a really unique flavor. Yeah, that's interesting. All right. So. That's the sweetness part of it. The next is we need to adjust the tannic aspect. And for that- So what is your concept, Brian? I'm very curious to hear what this is. There's two ways we can do this. We can either add a tea bag and let it sit for a week, dry tea it, or we can oak it. Yeah. I think oaking this is going to be the way to go. I don't even want to think about which oak to use. It's French oak, no doubt. French oak. This needs a little bit more of the sweetness. The vanillins yeah. would definitely help offset some yeah. of the acids in here. So let me go grab a French vanilla stick. I'll be right back. Okay, so I went and got a French oak super plus char. This is from Ken at Barrel Char Wood Products. Derek will put a link in the description below. Check him out. Um, he sends us stuff all the time. They're not actually a sponsor of the show, but they might as well be. Their wood products are just fantastic. We've tried various like spirals and this, that, chips. Mm -hmm. Their stuff actually makes a huge difference yeah. and it tastes really, really good. Yeah. The French oak, our favorite. We just love it. Yeah. That's why I chose it for this one. What you do, throw it in some boiling water for about five minutes or so, and then pull it out and burn yourself. Yeah, I don't know how you did that. Throw it, because what else am I supposed to do? I'm not putting the water in there. No. Once you've put the oak in there, you want to give it some time. A couple weeks, probably. This probably needs to sit for a while anyway because we did stir up quite a bit of lees in there. But what we're doing is we're adjusting as we go, okay? And that's part of homebrew. You can just say, oh, well, it is what it is and accept it. Or as you're going, you can say, hey, you know what? We can make this adjustment. We can make that adjustment. We may not be done. We may need to sweeten more. But the trick is never over sweeten while you're doing it. Always go just a little bit below what you might think. Like I thought, okay, that's good. Could we add more? Maybe. But any less would not be good for me. So I'm right at that tipping point, which means in a couple weeks, could it mellow out a little bit more and now it's just right? Whereas if we added more sweetness and when it mellows out now, it's too sweet. Yeah. So you wanna play that game all the time, but it definitely was watery. I think that Brian's decision to use French oak to add that tannin addition to it was absolutely 110% the right direction to go. Because if we added more tea, that was just going to push that, that puckery tartness thing that we had going right. on from the over acidic pomegranate, which you may think is counterintuitive because the balancing of the tannins versus the acidity, you want to have 
slightly more in one direction or the other, uh, but they shouldn't be doing the same thing. But in this case, the sensation was similar. So we wanted to do something that gave the mouthfeel without adding more of that bitter puckeriness. It'll so, be viscous is what it is. Yeah. Plus, every layer that you can add gives complexity. That's why, like, we could have just taken lingonberry concentrate, add water, add yeast, done. Absolutely. That would, that would make lingonberry wine. Add honey to it, now you got meat. And you could be done at that point. It would be nice, but probably a little bit boring. By adding the lemon peel, we added a level of complexity. It upped the acidity level. Might have actually upped it a little too much. Yeah, and okay? I think part of that is that we weren't really familiar with the lingonberry on its own. I don't expect it to be that acidic. So I've only had it a couple times, and it was preserves, and they were nice and sweet and fruity, and you know, it was wonderful. And the only time I've had it was in salsa water, so that's yeah. naturally acidic. So I just attributed that to the salsa water rather than the lingonberry itself. And even when we tasted it in the water, it tasted really sweet and fruity. It didn't have that acidic bite like a. Cran it tasted very cranberry. Yes. Uh, yes. Very cranberry. But if our brains just went a little bit past that connection, we would have realized, yeah, cranberry can be really acidic too, mm -hmm. so... But it's okay. It fermented out clean, yes. everything worked, yes. um, and now we just want to play with those flavors and get them to fall where we want so that we can produce a brew that we really, really enjoy. In other words, instead of going, this is a six, put it on a shelf, and that's the end of it, we're going to take a six and make it a seven, maybe make it an eight, maybe make it a twelve, who knows? But we will see you in a couple weeks when this has cleared out and has extracted some more wood. So right after I shot the camera, Derek said, hey, we were supposed to give them a specific gravity reading of how much lingonberry juice we added. So here's your reading, 1.010. Pretty much exactly what I said. So yay, awesome. And I'm gonna make a note on that. See you once this clears out. Houston, we may have a problem. In our haste to add the oak to this, we had actually sweetened it already, and then added the oak, put the airlock back on, and put it on the shelf, and thought, hey, it's all good, right? Well, when we were getting ready to do this video, I looked at it and I said, we added more concentrate to this. We brought it to a 1.010 gravity. I thought I saw some bubbles coming out of there. <laughs> Let's find out, did this re-ferment? <laughs> In case you're wondering what I'm talking about, just because it's stopped once doesn't mean it's done, okay? If you add more sugars, if you dilute it, it can restart fermentation again. Let me restate that. If you add more sugars to an already dry brew, it can restart again. If your brew stopped, but it's past the alcohol tolerance of your yeast and you dilute it, it can restart again. So those two things, though they're different, they're actually the same concept. And because we did add some sweetener, Let's find out, did this actually re-ferment? Well, what do you know? 1.010. It didn't actually re-ferment. Let me do some calculation here using the calculator the teacher said I would never have handy that happens to be right here in my pocket. Okay, so this started at, come on, recognize me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Better recognize. This started at 1.084. Right? It went to 1.000. So that's 1.084 minus 1.000. Gives us 0 0.084. I use the coefficient of 135. Some people like 131.25. I'm using 135. Times 135 gives us 11.34% alcohol. Now, I know the Premier Classique can actually go a little higher than 11%. I think it's a 13. So it's a little low, but it's another proof of yeast can't read. The yeast went dormant because the original stopped. We added more sugars. It didn't reactivate them. I'm not complaining because that means we don't have to pasteurize this one. That was the key. If this had actually started up again, we were going to have to pasteurize. Now, we did add the French oak to this, and we did also add the uh, sweetener. So let's do a bit of a tasting here and see what we think. You know what, while we're doing this, can we just put a lid on that? Absolutely. So color-wise, it's really nice and clear. That's, that's on the very upper end of the scale for clear. Unusual color, it's orange. Yeah. Rather than red from lingonberry. Heady smell, it's got a good, good smell. It's very like citrusy, it's, it's really nice. Well, lingonberry kind of comes across like cranberry almost. Yeah. It's like a floral citrusy almost to me in the aroma. 
He made a face. Not sure what that face was. Mmm. <laughs> we did good. Adding the oak changed this. Oh, it boy. mellowed it, it smoothed it. The rough edges are gone. The aroma needs to catch up. The aroma's nice, the taste is better. All right, you know what? You can, and I'll pour you a little bit more. Because I can't imagine adding anything more to this, really. Here you go. Cheers. <laughs> so, let me get another sip. Are you gonna take us on a trip? As it enters, you do get from the aroma, it's a little bit harsher on the aroma. And that initial hit gives me a little bit more of a, an astringency than the rest of it does. But the very initial impression is a little bit astringent. Then it becomes very sweet with a light fruit, like a berry-like fruit. Um, I can't really explain that, but there's almost like a berry floral. It, it's kind of that. Yep. Um, then the middle, it just, the vanilla starts to come in. And I'm guessing the vanilla is coming from the charred wood. Yep. Because we didn't add vanilla to this. Yeah. But that vanilla is coming through and it, that just smooths it. It makes it feel almost creamy. And then on the finish, it's kind of got a lingering finish. Um, the, the tartness of the lingonberry with a little bit of that fruity flavor just kind of hangs there for a while. Really, really nice overall. I'm, I'm very impressed with this. The I also get the tannin sensation on the end too from yeah, the oak. Yeah, this is rich and thick, even though, I mean, obviously it's just a liquid, but it's rich and thick. It's very, very, very nice. The honey that we used for this was a wildflower honey. And I think that might be where some of the uh, the floral notes the are floral coming in. aromatics are coming from. That must be, but it seems more pr pronounced than I'm recalling in other oh, of these that we've yeah, done. Yeah, most definitely. I think maybe the lingonberry has some of that already, and it's making it come that much more. The lingonberry and honey mix is beautiful, though. Oh, yeah. It just works really, really well. Definitely getting some honey character without a tremendous amount of honey flavor. And that's why we like to use like the wildflowers, stuff like that. that they add something, but they're, I still consider it more of a neutral honey, okay? Even though some people would say wildflower is not. It depends on the wildflower honey. Maybe the one that we have is. It was Bev's, I think. Probably. Yeah, if it's Betty's, then it's, it's a true wildflower honey. Um, and it's pretty neutral in flavor when it comes to that kind of thing. But I'm impressed. This is really nice. This, this is actually way better than I thought it was gonna be. This is lovely. I, I could imagine drinking this chilled mm -hmm. on a hot summer day because it has that tart, sweet, refreshing note to it. There's not much else to say here. Yeah. This is pushing six to seven weeks old at this point. I would say this is ready to bottle. I don't want to change anything. It's got a nice clarity to it. Beautiful, everything about it. Um, there's a little bit of sediment at the bottom, so we'll just have to be very careful when we're racking it. But it has the right amount of oak. I don't want any more wood added. I can taste it, but it's not overpowering. Yeah. Everything about this is wonderful. So I think we're good to go for numbers. Oh yeah, we're gonna put numbers on this. That's right, we're trying out a new system where we're only gonna put numbers on something when we feel it's ready to be bottled, okay? We used to do the whole bottling thing and then give numbers and then it was like, oh, I wish we did this. Well, now we did that. And now you get the final number before we bottle. And then in a year is like the real tasting, okay? Cause that lets it sit and meld and age and you get the real number and we see that it get better or not. So I'm thinking of a number. I am thinking of a number as well. One, two, three, Eight. nine. Yeah. This is good. <laughs> this this is really good. Um, I didn't go higher because I think just based on age alone, this this can get sure, better. Sure, sure. Um, but I couldn't see going lower than a nine because I was like, okay, would I reach for this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I would fill a mug and drink this. No problem as it is right now. I think the strength of the wood is what has pushed it higher for Brian. For my tastes, I, I think I would have liked it to be a little bit more berry forward and I feel like the oaking has pulled that back some. So that's why yep. I gave it a lower number. Do I feel like it's over oaked? Not really because it has such 
a lovely combination of flavors yet that are working in harmony together and that prominent floral note is really exciting to me so i i like it all right well let's let's get to the bottling process and um sanitize these things since you know i drank from it Time to bottle. You know what that means? It means we need a bottling wand, which is just a piece of plastic tubing with a valve on the end that lets the liquid flow or stop depending on if you have it pushed or not. Stick it on your tubing about half an inch. Any more and you're probably gonna have trouble getting it off any less and it'll probably fall off all on its own. Don't ask me how I know. That end goes in a bottle. This end, I'm leaving the cap on. There's some goop, AKA lees in the bottom here that I don't want in our bottles. So I'm just gonna go about halfway in and I'm gonna get this started. Now, because there is still lees in the bottom, I'm actually not gonna put this to the bottom of the fermenter. I wanna keep the clear stuff in the bottles, and then maybe the last bottle will be a little bit murky. Ta-da! Seven bottles, not too shabby. Now, obviously, this one on the end has the least in it, and if you look, I don't know if you can see it, it's the most cloudy of them all. See, how, see the difference? I have a monitor here, that's how I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, but you see how this one's a little bit more cloudy. It's also not quite as full. This one will get drank sooner, even though we want to let this kind of clear out a little bit. So we might actually put this in the fridge, cold crash it, yeah. and let this one clear out. But then the rest of these, what are we going to do with those? They're going to sit. <laughs> Besides that. We're going to label them, and one of them is going to be in the one-year cabinet. And another one, because it's turned out so well, is going to rest in the two-year cabinet. And we will revisit these then. As always, guys, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.